in terms of entrepreneurial small startup innovation, uh, Aaron has been a pioneer there, founding a festival that he'll tell you about, being a, a startup uh, CEO himself, I think a couple of times, and now he's a leader of the New Jersey Innovation Ecosystem with the R&D Council. So uh, it's great to have him here. I've known Aaron for four or five years now, um, but uh, we'll get started with Aaron telling us a bit about who he is, where he came from, uh, and his sort of innovation history. Uh, so, but Aaron, give us a bit on your top two or three entrepreneurial things that started, failed, and why. So, yeah, I'll share two. One is, um, this might be, you know, imagine the world. I know, Marcus, you can, you can probably easily imagine this, but around 1997, 1998, you know, broadband proliferation, uh, you know, things were still very much in the early stages. Um, I was a junior, a junior in college and uh, frustrated with, with the inability to get in touch with local restaurants, especially late at night when I may not have been completely sober. So, so that inspired, and I, and I was always obsessed with technology and the, this, I mean, I had this giant, I love technology poster that it was an ad from HP on the wall. It was always part of my, my thinking. Um, and so my best friend and I came up with this idea of why can't we order food online? We can do all these other things online. At, at that point, sort of I am and chat, and it was early stage of e-commerce and where I was doing financial trading, but it was early days of those kinds of tools. And so we started a service in 1997, 1998 called Deliver You, which was while we were still in school to help uh, enable online ordering for restaurants. So what people know today is gr the Grubhubs mm -hmm. and Seamless and those types of services, which seems so obvious of course today but at the time we were among the first of just one or two other companies like this um we, we believe we were right just a few months before seamless launched and we would go into restaurants and this might be hard to believe for those who you know who certainly who were younger at the time or maybe not a lot um and they would say to us who's ever going to want to order food online that's crazy and so the world was just very different and so the, the first lesson, well, and, and we did okay. I wouldn't call it a failure, but we didn't have some enormous, you know, nine-figure sale. Um, the first issue I recognized there, and looking back, is timing does matter. Um, I think you know that you so might have the best. just wasn't ready for online ordering. That's right, and just and and just a little bit longer it was. And if we had had the staying power, which is another part of last year, we may have become the seamless. Um, but the world was not ready. The, culturally, the world hadn't adopted. Technology was mixed. College campuses actually made sense because many of them did have broadband. They invested in, like I had a T1 line, which was a very unusual thing then. I'm sure you had it at Bell Labs, but it, you know, it wasn't widely available. Um, we should just remind everyone what a T1 line rate is. Do you remember, Aaron? <laughs> I mean, I don't think I could define it the way you, I'm sure you could, but it was very it's, fast uh, internet. It's 1.5 megabits per second. Well, at the time, <laughs> I didn't, actually, I didn't know the speed. Yeah. I'm surprised it was that slow, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. modems, were, remember, um, modems were kilobits per second. So that's right. Yeah. Megabits per second sound, felt, felt like the world. That's right. Wow. I, I, I'm, that's a great reminder. I yeah. did not realize. It's all perspective. And, yeah. and so we did ultimately bring on many of the college campuses. I'm sorry, college, the restaurants around our, our college campus. We did bring on other uh, reps from other campuses to... To, uh, we, we, I was at the University of Maryland, so we brought on a lot of the D.C. campuses, Georgetown and America, and a few others. And we were, were reasonably successful. We were processing three to 5,000 orders a month, which we thought was, which was incredible, really. It was a, I mean, that was a big accomplishment. Um, the, the next lesson is probably what, what killed business. Um, our model was we started out at 5%. It was our, we, we said to the restaurant, we'll take 5% of your order as the fee. Our average order was $12. So we took 60 cents an order. And the math just didn't make sense for this. Because you, you, you did the delivery? We just took the order. We didn't do the delivery. I see. Okay. So the, and also, I mean, honestly, the name was a bit of a misnomer in retrospect as well. Deliver You um, well, maybe wasn't the best name. We didn't do the delivery. We just took, we just processed the order. And, and, and you know, you cut me off when you want. I've got so many stories about this. But this was at a time when, when you place an order, we had to process effects. We paid 10 oh, cents per wow. page. I mean, it was very oh. early. I used to walk around with, oh, I wish I remember the name of it, but basically a little flip top pager. When the faxes failed, we had technology that I could resend the fax from this pager. It wow. Was, it, it was great. We built a system where 
it would call the restaurant from the order. The, the restaurant could type in how long the order would be till it's ready for pickup or delivery, and then it would send an email to the customer to say, your order's been confirmed. It'll be delivered in 30 minutes. But you know, whatever they typed in the phone, it would, for 1997, 98, kids, I was pretty psyched with what we came up with. Um, <laughs> but the, the financial model was broken, and we were, I think, a bit just, just too immature to, to know or too, you know, or too dumb, I don't know. But, but we weren't smart enough to think about bringing on a set of eyes who I think would have been really helpful. I, again, you know, bringing this back to where I am now, this idea of building community besides the fun of it, and I do very much enjoy, I make great friendships. Uh, the key is that bring, you know, to, to surround oneself with people who can help, who are smarter, who have experience, who can say, you know, your financial model is broken. Why don't I help you work on something? Let me ask you the right questions to get you a place where this might make sense. Um, maybe you need to raise some capital, which we should have done at the time. Yeah. Um, I took some anecdotal advice from someone who said, oh, they raise money, they're just going to steal the business. That was a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had raised money, we would have had the staying power, and much more importantly, we would have been surrounded by sort of the adults in the room, so to speak, who would help us figure out there were some serious flaws in the business. So we had a, we had a lot of fun. We did end up selling it to a, a, a partner, basically, who was a minority partner in the business. It wasn't a huge financial win. It was a great time. I have absolutely no regret. Um, but this was a time when most of my friends graduating school were going into more traditional career paths. And this is kind of what started the path for me of, of it, sure would have been, it sure would be great if I could have other people who are experienced some of the other sorts of things that are problematic in my career who could help. Who, who, one, who could just sort of help be, be um, you know, help it not be such a, a solitary lifestyle, but also who might say, you know, here are a bunch of things to do. So I, I think surrounding oneself with advisors out of the entrepreneurial state, but I think in general, if, gonna, if you want to pursue a career at uh, Bell Labs for your life, I would, I think the same is true. To surround yourself with people who help shape your career, um, who push you into different directions, help you think about what does the next year look like? What does the next five? What does the next 10 look like? So I, I agree. We'll get to your next one because I'm fascinated to know where you go from Deliver You. Uh, but m my personal point of view is uh, know what you want and ask for help getting it. That's uh, I have always found, and this because I'm British by background, it's it's sort of not really accepted to do that. So that's why I live in the U.S. because it's much more compatible with my ideals, which is I know what I want at some point, and you don't know it in advance. I don't think I knew in year one or year five. But at some point you see it, right? And, and, and an example is running Bell Labs. I, at some point I said, I think I could do that. But the chance of someone also thinking the same thought who's in control of that decision without you mentioning it to them is precisely zero, right? They're not going to suddenly think, what about Marcus, uh, if you have never mentioned it? So you have to ask and say, How, what should I do? And then, of course, they become invested in the process if, they, if you've done some reasonable things. Of helping you get there because I find people actually are very well intentioned if you have a good community around you to help you get what you'd like if you're reasonable about it and not uh, you know aggressive or or, or too uh, nakedly ambitious and self-serving or something like that so I, I agree that surrounding yourself by advisors as you say and those advisors also become the enablers because generally they're connected to people who can get you what you want is is really critical but you can't approach them saying i just want you to help me it has to be that you have relationships in there that's where the power comes is because they actually want to help you because they have some personal relationship with you or someone you know so that community plays a key role but know what you want and ask for it is is my, the other part of my equation i would say i, I think the asking is is very important i think you're right that culturally uh, embracing where you are in the world here, embracing the idea that, that asking is okay, accepting a no is okay, being a bit persistent yep. even if you get a no is generally okay, maybe depending on where you are you know, in, a, in the organization or how you approach something, but generally being a bit persistent is, is welcomed and often celebrated. Um, I, I think the market, you know, to your point, Marcus, it's, it's absolutely critical that people have an authentic relationship, that if it comes across as using someone, it's a two-way yep. street. Uh, you, you know, and any of you, you're starting now with, with Nokia Bell Labs, I'm sure, you know, if you were to pay attention to Marcus's posts and read what he's been doing in the past and just have relevant 
frequency and have a conversation and say, oh, I noticed you wrote about this idea. Have you thought about, you know, this other idea? If you show that you actually care about what he's invested in and what his, his own goals are, the organizational goals are, showing that there is a two-way street that it's – I mean, you know, putting Marcus in the spot here, but in general, in networking and reaching out to people, I, um, think about how you can bring value to the relationship. And I think sometimes people see someone like you, Marcus, and think, well, there's no way I could be – what could I possibly provide in, the, in exchange here? But people might be surprised. I think part of it might just be being authentic and paying attention and trying to be helpful, whether it's in a point of view, or you see someone who's posting, if you're watching someone on social and they post about, hey, this is something, you know, we're working on this project and you bring a potential solution to the table. You know, I've opened doors with plenty of celebrity type, you know, uh, thought leaders by just paying attention to what they were talking about and then having something relevant to the conversation. So it didn't just look like I wanted to put their name you know, on the masthead of now, you know, featuring XYZ person. So I, I do, I think being authentic in those relationships matters. And, and also, it's okay that you might ask 10 people for help and one says yes. If you do that enough, eventually you have five to 10 people around the table who want to help. Um, but expecting that you'll get a few people who just aren't that engaged. And, and it's also personal. You make sure you put the people the right way, right? Um, I think that it's the idea of failure here, like that's part of the process. Not everyone is going to want to jump in. You're not going to click with everyone, but finding people who do you know, and sticking with those people, I think, in the long run, will, will pay off in building right. authentic relationships. Absolutely. And we'll get to the next startup in a minute, but you've, you've reminded me of a, a sort of related point that we've touched on, but not explicitly. Uh, the term vulnerable, uh, I think, is uh, perhaps feels a, a little bit weak, uh, but my personal view is until you know yourself, which includes your deficiencies, and you can express them when you ask for help. I'm bad at this. I really tried. So it's not just I'm lazy. I've tried. I'm really not good at this. Can you help with this thing? Is part of knowing what you are good and bad and being able to tell someone you're good or bad at that, and particularly the bad, so they understand that they are providing a real value to you, not just that you are using them for because it's easier for them to do it. I think being aware of who you are, what you're good at, what you're not good at, and being able to tell someone else, I'm good at this, but I'm really bad at this. Can you help? That's your, I think what you call authentic is actually being genuine and open in the exchange. Would you agree? I, I would absolutely agree. Everyone, I am sure, and maybe I'll ask you, Marcus, that Marcus has plenty of things that he's stumbled on in his career. You know, from... From the outside looking in, often it look, things look shiny and bright, and this person has just had a fantastic career. And 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 I, I think that looks to be the case. You know, if we, if I if I point to you, Marcus, I am sure you could look back and say there were plenty of times where you stumbled, where you had some area of vulnerability, where things didn't go quite the way you wanted, and it's how you react in those moments that I think shapes you know, the future. And so sharing those moments of vulnerability with people who might be able to help you get through those times, who might say, you know, here's a here's a way to navigate this. This year, you know, I'm dealing with this now. Here's a way to navigate a board relationship. Here's a way to potentially think about, you know, in, in recruiting and retaining employees that might be, you know, putting some challenges that I wasn't expecting, right? Everyone, or, or certainly people in the business world, can relate to those kinds of struggles. And no one has had a, um, you know, the, the, this perfect, what I described as sort of up into the right career path. Yep. So I agree completely. I mean, and it really might be personal. I've shared with people how entrepreneurship has taking a significant toll uh, on my family, my marriage. And I think being open and honest about that, which, is, which obviously is very vulnerable, um, it's a lot, that's not something that's often talked about. A lot of people say, you know, me too. And here, you know, some people, some people get divorced over these things. Some people have worked it out and just sharing those stories. I, yeah. I think, you know, being vulnerable about those, those things, I think it builds human connection and, and then people help one another. I, I think humans are inherently connect over, well, things that they are all good at, again, uh, sort of tribal behavior, we're all good at this, let's do that. But also the deeper connections are the things we're not good at that we help each other with, right? And so I think uh, that's really key is uh, is be able to say to someone, I tell the, I talk to my leaders about this, I ask them the question, tell me what you're not good at. And actually, many of them struggled because they'd been in careers so long where they had been successful. They, they couldn't actually remember something that they weren't good at, but I pointed out to them, that just means you're not doing anything new. If your life is everything you're good at, meaning you're good at your marriage, you're good at your raising kids, and you're good at your job, you're just not 
trying anything new. So you've defined a small box of goodness and and then the rest of the world doesn't matter to you. That's why you don't know what you're not good at. And I think it's a, if you're good at everything, you are just in a tiny little box. You're a big fish in a little pond you've built and you're ignoring the big pond. And, and that's a it's a sign for me that you're not big enough in your aspiration if you think you're good at everything. And if you can't say I'm not good at things, that's just a weakness of character, I think, not a strength, right? I, I completely agree with you on this. I, I will say, I think leaning in sometimes the areas where you have a, a strength is important, and, and it's, it's worth highlighting, either, you know, for my career, I really wanted to be the startup tech CEO. Like in my mind, that, that, that sort of stereotypical person that you read about was what I was focused on becoming. And it wasn't until someone was saying to me, you know, you've, you've gotten really good at community building. I mean, it took me six or seven years of what I, you know, the New Jersey Tech Meetup. Someone said, you know, you know this, this meetup, which is begging for attention, and had, I mean, I never, I never advertised it. We had 150 people each month. This seems to be your sort of superpower. Maybe you should pay more attention. And in my yeah. mind, the, the, the organizer or event host was never a role I found sort of sexy or appealing or I wanted to describe myself as. And, and once I accepted that, actually, there's a way that I could have a, a business here and, and and be creative in this way. When I when I embraced what had become this superpower, that that's when actually things got significantly better. That's a really good point to make. Is I think the other point is understand your superpower. So yeah, while you should understand what you're not good at, generally your superpower is the thing that you should probably anchor on. But knowing your superpower doesn't come early. In my experience, I think I only learned about my superpower when I was about 40. I'm very quick at thinking about things. That actually turns out to be my superpower. But I don't think I realized that until I was later on. And so putting me in a place where quick thought is required on many topics, that's where I'll be good. But had I figured that out earlier, I probably could have thought about how to use that in different ways. I'm not in any way complaining about where I ended up. But knowing your superpower is really important, as well as knowing your weaknesses. Would you agree? I, I would agree. And I think being honest with yourself, about what you might want your superpower to be and what it actually is, right? Yeah, so there's a difference true. there. Yeah, um, mine was definitely and, to play in the Premier League, uh, and I <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that uh, I had physical deficiencies. <laughs> yeah, but you know, we, we all grow up or for whatever reason have these these goals in mind for ourselves, and we got to get to here. And sometimes getting to a different place is just as good or better. But having the you know, it, it's freeing. To think about, um, actually, you know, being quick on my on my feet and, and and quick thinking actually would that applies itself really will really well here. And maybe I shouldn't therefore think about these other things because it's a different skill set. Yeah. And in my case, you know, thinking about okay, well, how can I add my own entrepreneurial twist and creativity to um, what is actually typically a kind of a stale event world worked out for my benefit. And we you know, we took some risks and some things worked and some things didn't, but that for me made it all the worthwhile. So let's get to where you ended up in a minute, because I want uh, you to talk about how New Jersey R&D Council and all that, because it's it's been a great success for you. The question came in, how do you uh, persist when people are resistant to new ideas and change, which of course is always the way, but what's the right way? The question is, how do you get the benefit of a community who might oppose you uh, while keeping uh, on your original trajectory. And I think the part of the answer is you have to find a group of believers who you surround yourself with as well as those who are going to question. Otherwise, you'll, you'll essentially not progress. But what's your formula for that? I was thinking the same thing. I saw this question pop in and, I, and my initial reaction was, well, I, that's not really my experience. My, the community of people that I'm surrounded by don't by default start with no. And so I, and it's what you just said. I think it's surrounding yourself with a broad community and using the word loosely. Um, your parents may, may be nervous and they might, you know, with your own future, you know, in mind, might be nervous about how stable it is, whatever it is you're pursuing. Um, it's just going to lead to a career that works for you. And I, I, so that's one element of the community. And then there's other people who, in my case, people like the New Jersey Tech Meetup and now the New Jersey Tech Council community who culturally are more open to change, they're more open to how might things be different. But some of the traditional communities, like your, your friends perhaps at school, who are, if they are pursuing more traditional paths, might be nervous. Um, I, I think that there's an element, I, I think you should appreciate 
that if people are resistant to change, first, is it that they are, you know, they care about you and they're worried about where you're headed? Um, is that they genuinely think you don't have a good idea, which is, and it's just an important thing to listen to. And I think there's, there's some element of accepting that, that resistance and pursuing the path to a point. And I think what comes with it is being honest with yourself about, is it working? How far do you go? It can't be failure forever, right? It's got to work at some point. So there is a balance of time. When I was, you know, 97, 98, right out of college, I had this feeling that time was never ending. I wasn't, as, I didn't feel the sense of urgency in a way that I do today. I probably would have cut things off with some, you know, one business a year earlier and another down the longer. I was more in touch with the element of urgency. So I think that it's important to be in touch with the community of people around you, to be, to, to give serious um, weight to the things that those people share with you, to also get comfortable that you're, the whole nature of being innovative will be that some people, probably the majority of people will disagree. Yeah, I and, agree. And, yeah. My, my view is uh, 10% of people are dreamers who see a different future and 90% believe the current reality is okay and, and, and maybe it needs to evolve a bit, but it doesn't need a revolution. But entrepreneurship and innovation in general is trying to fight, create revolutions. Not always, but for most of the time, really deep innovation is about a revolution. Yet the world, 90%, wants at best an evolution. And so I think you always have to accept that you're going to be in a place where your ideas are opposed, but that means find the people around you who will support you because you, you can't be a, a lone voice. But listen to the naysayers because the naysayers have a point of view. So in Bell Labs, what we say is we, we think about the future 10 years out, but then we connect it back to today because the today problem still has to be solved before you get to the future. And that's where you'll find your hardest naysayers. Everyone will believe 10 years from now, something could be different. But if it's hard to get there, meaning they have to change what they do today, that's where your biggest innovations are. Smoothing the path from today to that future is actually the harder part of the problem than inventing something brand new. I, I totally agree. And I think there's, you know, from my perspective, when I think about that narrative and the element of, of what's often the pitch, the start pitch, and you're looking to sort of bring people along and do you believe in this yeah. future? It usually starts with, here's the problem statement, here's the problem in the world, and Here's our solution. Yeah. But when I'm talking about these kinds of things, I bring up the problem statement. I'm I'm looking for buy-in around the table. If people don't believe in that future, if you start with your solution, they don't care. They're already thinking, well, no, you know, if your solution is drones are going to deliver, you know, drones are going to be the waiters and waitresses babies. of all drones, drones are going to deliver babies. Let's go with that instead of yes, yeah, right. <laughs> and if they if they are like, no way, that's never happening. Who cares about the solution? So getting the, you know bringing them along, I think again yeah. to the human element. A good, a good, a, a working on the style of one communication so that you can connect with people and bring them along because you, especially in this world, I, I completely agree with you on the, the ten percent, and I hope it's that high um, of people who really. Yeah, my experience it's, it's one to five percent is actually the believers in a different future. But you're right. If you bring, if you work to bring people along, we talked about this with the group. Uh, Richard Hamming, our, one of our famous Bell House people, says so you basically becoming a great presenter. So you sell your work and, uh, or sell your idea. And it, it's not a facile thing. It's actually allowing people to see the same thing you see. And maybe you see it naturally and they don't. But their opposition to it is important too because those are the problems you have to solve for your reality to become a reality as opposed to an idea. You have to get from today yeah. to there, which means you have to address their issues. Yeah, and, and I, I completely agree with that. You're, you're listening to their points of view because you're right. Even if you have this 10-year vision, there's a practical way of how you're actually going to get yeah. people might be your customers, right? And I also think, you know, again, maybe on youth, right? I was a fired up 20-something-year-old entrepreneur who, who had that mentality of who cares what they think. But yeah. there's wisdom in bringing people along. There's wisdom in getting friends in the, in the traditional industries. Um, yeah. I, I completely agree with you on this. Yeah. But this is fun, Aaron, at least for us. Uh, and hopefully this is for, great. The, Thank you. for the participants. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for doing it. I learned a lot myself. Uh, I, it's always great to be with you. I really appreciate it. And I wish everybody a very successful summer uh, personally and with Nokia Bell Labs.